Hello, my name is Max. I write and film the Russian invasion of Ukraine from the inside through the eyes of the military and I want to talk about the stages of his war and the counteroffensive as such. I will not talk about when, where, how it will take place and how it will end, no. Because a counteroffensive is good when people learn about it already when it is coming to an end, as it was in Ukraine near Kharkiv, when the Russians were running away the through equipment and ammunition. Every stage of this war is important and awesome. When you try to put everything in order, it becomes both joyful and painful at the same time. Let's figure out together why the coming counteroffensive is so important to many countries of the world and why this importance is not working for the benefit as well. What about everything in order? The war in Ukraine has not lasted for just 16 months. It continues since February 2014. Ukraine at that time, the largest European country in terms of territory and the most naively peaceful. She gave up nuclear weapons for a guarantee of security, sovereignty and inviolability of borders from the USA, Great Britain and Russia. Has been selling off its weapons for decades. Until 2014, Ukraine allocated 1% of its GDP for the entire defense sector. At the time before the war in 2014, the Ministry of Defense of Ukraine has Russian citizenship like many other high-ranking officials appointed by the pro-Russian president Viktor Yanukovych. Then-president was afraid of civil protests, didn't want to fulfill the agreements of negotiations with representatives of the Maidan and fled to the territory of Russia, where he's still hiding. Even before the escape of Yanukovych, Russian military without identification marks arrived on the Crimean Peninsula and on February 26 captured administrative buildings in the city of Simferopol and then began attacking Ukrainian military units. As a result, Ukraine without an elected commander-in-chief is unable to even make a decision to oppose an annexation of Crimea with arms. The temporary government at the time brought Ukrainian troops to the continental territory, hoping for the reaction of the world, high legal diplomatic or other modern methods to stop and punish the occupier. Russian aggression does not end there, and already a couple of months later, a decision on armed defense is made in the form of an anti-terrorist operation against armed groups of Russian and pro-Russian units that size administrative buildings and begin a series of murders, kidnappings and seizure of enterprises in Donetsk and Luhansk regions. Ukrainian defenders then are a mixture of poorly armed regular soldiers, most of whom have never fought, and there are even fewer armed, motivated volunteers who want to defend their home. Apart from special forces, the first to go to troubled areas are National Guardsmen and volunteers. They arrive on buses because the Minister of Internal Affairs has fewer armored vehicles. The most active phase of the hostilities took place in 2014-2015. The Ukrainian military managed to actively liberate cities and villages before the Russian ground forces and units of the Wagner Group entered into a full-fledged confrontation in the summer of 2014. The battles in Ilovaisk and Tibaltseva were a turning point for Ukrainians. It was there that Ukrainian military personnel were surrounded and shot and the Ukrainian army lost its offensive potential and went on the defensive on the occupied line. Minsk agreements were assigned. Every year the activity of shelling subsided, although Russia continued not to comply with the Minsk agreements, not withdrawing its heavy weapons and military personnel from the territory of Ukraine. The Ukrainian army is undergoing reformation, all units rotate through part of their service in combat areas. This is the stage when the fate of Ukraine and the world depended on every Ukrainian and, in fact, only on us. The scale of the bombings, rocket attacks and offensive convoys shocked people all over the world and did the incredible resistance of ordinary civilians. The Russian military did not advance in accordance with military science, not because they were sure of a warm reception with flowers, this is a myth. The story of unexpected resistance 
can only be told by an uneducated conscript or Putin. But Russian military officers and contractors have extensive combat experience. Many of them fought in Donbas, Syria, Ichkeria, and some in Afghanistan. All these territories did not have air defense, aviation, or intelligence of a strategic level. So they could do whatever they wanted. And the Russians attacked Ukraine according to the same patterns, simply being sure that the sky was safe, because Russian missiles had already destroyed the entire Ukrainian aviation and anti-aircraft defense, and the partisans would be caught by experienced FSB officers. That is why air battles down in Russian planes and indestructible helicopters, detonation of radar systems and fuel tanks in convoys, burning tanks became a surprise. It was the most difficult stage, because no matter where a resident of Ukraine was, he thought that this was the end, that there were no more plans and that he would hardly be able to survive. The military was more mobilized and ready. Running through the forests in Rubizhna, I thought that would happen next. How to stop them? So that they would not go further to Luhansk region, Chernihiv region, to Kyiv. But I definitely did not think that after some four months we will be able to drive them out of Kharkiv region. The state of the Ukrainian defense forces was capable, unlike in 2014, but technically only for defense on certain lines and operations using the geography and weak points of the enemy to force unprepared units to retreat. The battle in the cities, from which the complete evacuation did not take place, are terrible for everyone and the most exhausting. This is the type of fight where you need to practice hundreds of practical things or you won't survive even a few minutes standing in the open, especially if no life is worth anything to your enemy. Memories of fighting in the city are the worst. Mariupol, Volnovakha, Papasta, Rubizhne, Svetohirsk, Kharkiv are cities that no longer exist or are hard to be recognized. It was around these cities that a large part of the Russian troops and equipment was destroyed or disabled. Even after capturing the ruins of most of them, the enemy lost its offensive potential and was no longer able to continue fighting at the same place. The Harkin and Harrison operations are successful cases of how to win without destroying cities and killing people. Surprise, exploitation of enemy weaknesses and successful use of modern high-precision weapons provided by Western partners are what changed the course of this war. There were no such operations in the world and the Ukrainians proved for the first time that they can conduct not only defensive and special operations, but also successful counter-attacks and strategic actions. Every war has its scale. The length of the front line in Ukraine today is 3,760 kilometers. The amount of ammunition used roughly corresponds to the active stages of the First and Second World Wars. Fewer forces are involved due to technology upgrades, where large concentrations of infantry are a weakness rather than an advantage. The only disadvantage of operations where the enemy retreats alone is that his army persists and will attack again. After successful Ukrainian counter-offensives, relative stagnation began. The solidar Bakhmut Avdiivka front became the main battle point. The fighting for the small town of Bakhmut lasted 10 months and it's still not fully occupied. Our unit has been fighting in the Bakhmut direction almost since the beginning and until now. Now, while part of our forces are holding back the enemy along the entire front line, we have used this stage to train fighters with new NATO weapons. Training is going well at all levels, from infantry to headquarters. But the enemy also used this time to make weapons and prepare. Will the expected counteroffensive succeed? In my opinion, yes. But there is a problem that worries me. Everyone liked how Kharkiv and Kherson were liberated. Everyone learned about the offensive on Kharkiv only when it was almost over. And now, due to increased PR, expectations are too high. On the one hand, this is good. Without it, the leaders of high-tech states would not want to support us and give us weapons so that we could restore and protect our people and our territories. 
but on the other hand, expectations are too high. It will be sad if they do not come true. Russia is limited by sanctions, but circumvents them to some extent and then can manufacture weapons itself. Under constant shelling, even under the best conditions, Ukraine cannot do this fully and is independent on other countries. Fortunately, Western countries have realized that this is not a threat somewhere far away, but that Russia threatens the entire security system that has existed since the end of the World War II. But still, for many outside of Ukraine, it remains not a merciless war for survival, but a form of politics. We hope and will make every effort to make the counteroffensive successful. We really hope that we will catch the moment and you will find out about the dismissal yesterday.